My name is Alexa. I'm coming to you from Special Needs Cobb. We're a nonprofit here in Marietta. Um, we own 23 group homes for adults with special needs in Cobb County. We also have a weekend respite program and we offer um, other resources and provide referrals to special needs family families in Cobb County and beyond. Thank you all for so much for joining us tonight. If you have any technical issues um, during Cheryl's presentation, please send me a message in the chat and I'll help you out once I turn things over to Cheryl. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our amazing speaker, Cheryl Rhodes. Cheryl is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's a consultant and certified neurodiverse couples therapist. She's an experienced mental health practitioner who's worked with families and individuals with autism and developmental disabilities for over 35 years, including siblings and grandparents. She is owner of My Roads Map LLC, providing counseling, coaching, consulting services, therapy, and more. On behalf of Special Needs Cobb and all the wonderful folks joining us here tonight, thank you so much for being here with us, Cheryl. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. So tonight's topic is Harmony at Home, Strengthening Family Ties Amid Stress. So right away, you can see three words that jump out, harmony, stress, and strengthening family. So hopefully we'll touch on all of those in a way that um, makes sense for you. Um, uh, Alexa, thank you for that lovely introduction. I really just want to call out also that, um, sorry, this is my computer skill here, um, that I'm a family member, um, parent of three adult children. Um, uh, my uh, middle daughter, middle child, old uh, younger daughter, middle child, um, who is all grown up now in her 30s, um, uh, has uh, developmental disabilities and autism. So um, I've been working in the field for a very long time, but also have been a parent uh, living experiences that are, as well as working with families that are similar to yours. So strengthening family ties, if you look at this first slide, um, if you can, I'm not sure it's a little blurry, but I really like this t-shirt. It says, this is not the life I ordered. Uh, sometimes when we have a family member um, with a disability, life just doesn't look exactly the way you thought it would. The truth is though, that sometimes it becomes the challenge of the disability. And we talk about what it's like living with a disability, but I wanna flip that question and have you think about this while I'm talking. What would your family be like if you had everything that you needed to be included, supported and successful? Because I truly believe that while parenting a child with a disability is very challenging. Sometimes it's because of the lack of supports that the family needs in order to be successful that makes that situation even more challenging. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. What is family support? What does that mean? What does it look like? And how might you be able to get it? So what we're talking about is services and supports that help to strengthen and enhance a family's ability to thrive while caring for and supporting their family member with disabilities. Again, calling out those words. We're not going to talk about coping and the challenges and how hard it is. I think everybody is well aware of that. What are some of the things that you can do to enhance your ability to thrive while caring for that individual with disabilities? In general, what that's called is quality of life indicators. So there are quality of life indicators for all of us, for people with chronic health conditions, for uh, families who have children with disabilities and others. So this is some um, information that was provided from um, a research and a survey. It was around families who had children with autism, but there are other researchers who have looked at quality of life for families of children with disabilities for a long time. And in addition to maybe uh, 15, 20 different variables, I've pulled out four that I think relate to this topic of stress, stress in the families. So one of those ways that you can see how well you're doing, is your family thriving or not, is uh, looking at it in terms of connection. Um, are, is your family able to spend time together as a family unit and also with others? Maybe it's friends, maybe it's extended family, maybe it's people at work in your church. 
Um, are you able to maintain family routines? How disruptive is that family unit as a result of the challenges that you're facing at home? And are you able to participate in community events and activities? Um, one of the things that families report quite often, again, if they're rearing a child or work, having a family member, is uh, really feeling isolated. And this sense of connection does get disrupted, particularly if your family member has a lot of behaviors or um, other challenges that make it difficult for you to go into the community. The flip side of it is how welcoming really is your community so that you and your family can participate in community events and activities. So think about that as we go through this, making connections versus being isolated. Um, cohesion versus fragmented. So cohesion really refers to the communication and support amongst your family members. Do people feel connected? Do you feel a sense of purpose as family? Um, do people feel like their needs are getting met? How well are you getting along and supporting and feel supported and able to support all the members in your family? Competence and knowledge is another area. Do you, as the caregiver, have the information that you need to be able to care for your child? Do you also have the competence or the skills to care for your child's behavior? Maybe it's even to help others be able to do that for you. And to what extent is your child also thriving or your family member? Where are their challenges with independence, um, social skills, behavior, participation in routine and communication? Because all of these things can add to a stressful situation and make it even more difficult for the family to feel competent and successful. Um, so this survey asks questions like, I know how to get services. I know how to uh, understand my child's communication. I, um, I feel competent to be able to deal with a challenging situation. And if not, then how do we make sure that you get those skills that you need so that you can be more competent? Another is well-being, and this refers a lot to access, so that's why that word is highlighted, access to health care, resources and services, financial stability, and physical and mental health. And that includes yourselves as well as those of all your um, family members. So I'm going to cover three themes or issues related to this broader topic of um, stress and strengthening families. So the first one that we're gonna look at is family members. There is an impact on family members when there is a child or an adult with disabilities in the house. The extent to which those family members are impacted and how um, sometimes it's a function of the disability itself. Sometimes it's a function again of those um, quality of life indicators. Are you getting the supports and services you need? Do you have proper training? Do you have access to respite? So, but each of those unique roles are filled by different members of the family and each one is impacted in a slightly different way. So I'm just gonna touch on this. We could spend uh, a day or probably even longer talking about this. Um, it's something that I'm really interested in both professionally and personally. Um, and I've written um, and done some research um, up on siblings and grandparents and also caregiver supports. So a lot of this information comes from that research and talking with families. So some of the unique concerns for parents and caregivers include self-care. How do I take care of myself while taking care of everybody else? Um, knowledge, again, I think we've touched on that. Having the resources. Sometimes it's even knowing where to get the resources. How do I find out about who can help me with? What do I do if somebody tells me this or that? Um, also a recognition of the strengths and challenges of your roles. Sometimes we're so busy doing that we don't take time even just to acknowledge um, what the impact is of the stress on ourselves. Families and parents and caregivers in particular really need respite and alone time. So we might want to focus on um, respite for a couple so that they can go out and have a date night or maybe it's date night at home. Um, and 
parents also need alone time. And I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about self-care because I truly believe that this is one of the ways that we can mitigate some of that stress. And the other thing is sometimes that families really need to look at and have realistic expectations. We'll talk about that more as well. So for siblings, we want to recognize siblings as individuals. Um, sometimes that becomes a challenge when there's one family member who demands more resources, whether it's parent time or money or um, access to services. But we have to recognize the siblings as individual and recognize each child's needs and accomplishments. They may have some of their own challenges. They may have um, need for one-on-one -on -one time with you. You might want to also work with the siblings to balance responsibilities so that they don't feel burdened um, or take on too many caregiver responsibilities and don't really have time to be a child themselves. It's a delicate balance. We want to provide time for each sibling, and there are programs available that do provide sibling support in the form of support groups, online resources, and books, and I would encourage uh, any family to look into some of these for your siblings. Um, if we have time and as we go through this, I may share a few anecdotes with you. The one I wanna share, uh, particularly before we leave here is though, is that oftentimes siblings feel a tremendous responsibility um, for the care for their sibling or their well being. Um, they may fight and scuff and scrap at home, but you know that's the kiddo who's going to be protective of their brother or sister now, um, maybe at school, in social situations. And um, I've heard many, many siblings, including my own, talk about how they're making their own life decisions, um, decisions about their future based on an understanding that at some point they may be required or see themselves actively involved in the care of their sibling in the future. The other group that's really important to consider is grandparents, and they also have unique concerns. They need a lot of information about the disability. They have sometimes have a lot of questions. They're not sure how to ask them. We parents get immersed in this and become familiar with the alphabet soup and the resources, but grandparents need to understand. So they need to be able to feel safe to ask questions. Maybe it's not with you. Again, maybe it's through other resources that you can provide for them. They also have concerns about the future. They're looking at this long term and they're looking at it from their perspective, you know, of their age. Um, there can be also financial implications if a grandparent wants to leave uh, money or um, other report uh, resources for a child with disability in the future. So they need to be informed so that they can do the best for their family, but also so that they can protect now and in the future. Um, sometimes grandparents really wanna help and they don't quite know how to. So um, an understanding and a recognition of that unique role that grandparents have and how they may contribute to family functioning. So a grandparent may not feel comfortable or able to um, do things directly with their grandchild with disabilities. Um, if they can, all the better, but helping them be able to communicate with that child, provide childcare or transportation, for the siblings, for their other grandchildren. Um, maybe the grandparent is somebody who can research something online for you or spend the time on a phone call while you're at work and you need to wait on phone for an insurance company to respond or make a doctor's appointment. There's lots of ways that grandparents can be helpful if given um, a little encouragement and some concrete suggestions. There also are, um, they're a little harder to find, but there are grandparent support groups and specific resources in the form of um, books, articles, information that can really help grandparents feel a little more connected. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is um, minimizing stress. And again, I think this is where we can um, see some impact on all of those roles and all of those different unique family members. First and foremost is, and if you take away anything tonight, please take this away uh, and bring it with you into your lives. Self-care isn't selfish. It's a necessity. And if you're, you know that old saying, if you're not happy, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. It's so true. 
your mental health has to be a priority if you're going to take care of your family. So you've all seen this before. I think it's important for all of us, myself included, to have that gentle reminder. You go on a plane and the first thing they tell you is you put the mask on yourself. Putting your mask on first is not selfish. It's in the interest of both you and the other person, you know, your child, your adult family member, that you take care of yourself. Otherwise, you put both of you at risk. So please, again, take that as your takeaway that self-care is essential. Stress affects people in different ways. How does stress affect you? And I'd like you to think about this as we go through this and then see which of the tips and suggestions that I um, include might work best for your type of stress. Lots of different variations on these themes, but generally some of the key ways that we see stress affecting people is anger. And this can be in the form of meltdowns, um, being really short tempered, um, angry, again, really short fuse, anger, um, judging, blaming others. It can be your health. Some people have somatic body responses. It can be headaches. We've even tracked and, um, you know, medical journals have shown that certain kinds of um, diagnoses and conditions are related to stress or that one of the key factors that makes things worse once you have a certain medical condition is stress. So stress can really affect our body, our mind, and really um, our spirit and our whole outlook on life. The third one is anxiety. And again, anxiety can take the form, many forms, and, but can be just as uh, debilitating as you know a headache or a body ache and just as um, destructive as anger, even though it tends to uh, be more inner directed. Okay, this is really important to think about too. People talk about this a lot. There is a very strong connection between stress and wellness. So we're gonna talk a little bit about wellness also. And um, stress is one of those leading factors that affects wellness. Some of the things that you can do, um, there's positive and negatives of these, but mindfulness and meditation, sleep, nutrition, activity, and that big balance between stress and physical health. It's something that's worth thinking about. Um, take these words also and see if you can think about this in terms of harmony in your family. Self-care is relationship care. If you want to be able to have a more calm, loving, caring environment at home, you have to be able to feel okay about yourself and be able to stay calm in the face of chaos. So you're going to do a couple of things. We're going to talk about some self-care strategies and stress buster tips in a, man in a minute. But one of the things that I would suggest is that you just choose one thing that you can do and then do it daily. Um, don't pick something that's either going to be very expensive or time consuming or something that you can't do. You're going to want to try to address stress on a daily basis. Keep your goal in mind, which is talking about what you want. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. Don't sweat the small stuff, shifting your perspective. I'm gonna give you some tips about that. Look for small wins. Those are the things that sometimes something goes bad, but something really goes well. And try to look for things that you can be grateful for. and. Also, um, keep going. Most of us don't even have the luxury to think about anything else. So if I say keep going, you might say, I have no choice. What is she talking about? You can keep going with some idea of optimism and that comes from feeling resilience and not being dragged down by the things that are so challenging. So what does self-care look like? What does self-care look like for you? I don't know, but there are many, many types. So there's eight here, and we probably could think of a whole lot more. If you look at this one slide, the areas that are covered are physical, emotional, social, spiritual, personal, space, which is your environment, financial, and work. And under that, there's a whole lot of things that you can do to try to take care of yourself once you identify 
either where you feel like you need the most support or where you're the most comfortable. You can start with an area that's where you already are experiencing some strength and want to make things better. Or you can start with the area where you're feeling right now the most depleted and you feel like you want to replenish and restore some sense of um, abundance in terms of self-care. Um, so let's just take a few of these that are probably the most common um, uh, emotional and some things that you can do. Lots written about this. Um, stress management, emotional maturity, forgiveness, compassion, kindness, um, social setting boundaries with people. We don't often talk about this, but if you're doing so much at home, you may have to set other boundaries with people and be realistic about what you can and cannot do. Um, you know, maybe you want to participate in a, a picnic or an outing, but you're going to be the one who brings the um, bottles of soda or the paper goods. Uh, you're not going to make your famous macaroni and cheese this time if it's just not a good time for you. Um, look to develop if you don't have any support systems. If you have support systems, look at how you can strengthen those and take more, better advantage of them. Um, if you're going to be um, going online or looking at social media, look for something that's positive. There's so much negativity um, around us. It's really hard not to be affected by that. Um, communication. Look at ways that communication can support us. Even the words that we use, the people we interact with, um, that connection between what we say and the messages that we give ourselves um, can be very, very powerful. For the people who you care about in those social settings, make time to, to spend time together. And again, we'll spend a little bit more time I'm going to talk about this last one, which is ask for help, because I think this is critical. Um, financial also, you know, you might have to take a hard look at budgeting or money management, paying bills, looking for financial support in the community. There's lots of different ways that you can take care of yourself. Um, the other thing that I want to mention that I think is critical, and now they're finding even more research on it too, is the benefits of humor and laughter. If you can take a minute and see the humor in a situation, even if it's um, something that typically would be very, very stressful, it's going to help you. Many, many um, uh, oncology programs, children's hospitals, and others have um, humor built in um, uh, wellness center programs. Um, there's a whole program where uh, there's uh, clowns that come around uh, through Children's Healthcare of Atlanta through their inpatient wards and such. Why? Why would why would we do this? What's the benefit? It improves your mood. It can reduce stress. It can boost your immune system. It can improve heart health, brain functioning, and also to relieve pain. So if you ever wondered about um, taking some time just to laugh with your kids or a moment for yourself, um, don't, don't give it a second thought. You're doing really good work for yourself. So I want to take a minute and talk about some stress busters, tips and tools. There's a lot of information on this slide. Again, I don't expect you to do all these things. I don't even expect you to remember it. Think back to what we said before about what your stressors are or where you think you might need some um, support right now. And as I go through these, see if there's something that just resonates for you. So in no particular order, get moving. That includes activity and exercise. Um, eat healthy. Sugar is not our friend. Um, we talk a lot about carbs and fat, but again, research is showing that sugar um, is a real contributor to many, many different problems that are all related to inflammation um, and, and, and even cognition. So uh, in fact, some are even calling Alzheimer's uh, the new or a form of diabetes. It, it's that sugar is that significant in our physical health. Think about this one, eat to live versus live to eat. Some people deal with stress um, through food 
comfort food in particular. If you can shift that a little bit, it can actually reduce stress because you won't be eating the foods that exacerbate all those other problems that we've talked about a little bit or that I'll continue to talk about. Stay hydrated. Drink more water than you think you really need or should. Lots. In fact, if you start drinking water, you'll actually find yourself getting thirsty because your body kind of settles into what you're providing. But when you start, it triggers that need for more water. Some experts recommend 64 ounces as a minimum up to half of your body weight. So if you weighed 200 pounds, that would be up to 100 um, ounces of water a day. I don't know how many people do that, but it's a lot more than you think. Limit caffeine and also think about when you go for food, is it hunger or thirst? Because actually, a lot of times it's thirst. And if you drink something, um, you'll feel better and it will also curb hunger. Uh, I try, especially if I'm going to be sitting at my desk for a long period of time, to have, um, just like I actually do now, um, a, a thermos that stays cold with water so that I can try to stay hydrated throughout the day, even if I can't get up from my desk. Slow down, shift gears to a slower pace. Sometimes we can do this with breathing exercises. You can do this before you go to bed. You can do it in the morning when you first wake up before you tackle the day. You can also even do it before an important meeting or if you're feeling stressed or tired in the middle of the workday or in the middle of your day at all. When you can, hit the pause button. And what I mean by that is just, you know, take a minute to slow down. Um, not just slowing down your baby, your breathing, but slowing down your life. Take baby steps. If you're going to make any kind of changes, don't jump in. It'll, you'll probably not want to continue it. Take really small baby steps. If you're looking to change your behavior for yourself or your children or the way you communicate, again, baby steps. Use time blocks. Um, people report this as being very, very effective. What that means is whether it's on your paper calendar, your whiteboard, your electronic calendar in your phone or on your laptop, to set aside time for yourself each day that you build into your schedule so that it addresses that question of I don't have time for. You know, there's certain things that we really do make time for every day and time for yourself, even if it's no more than five, 10 minutes, just setting aside time for yourself can really make a difference. Mindfulness and meditation is another whole area to explore. It's all about reconnecting with yourself. Um, also, um, now people are talking about the benefits similar to what we talked about with humor of um, being out in nature and also spending time with animals. If you have a pet, spend some time. If you don't have a pet, you can try to borrow one or visit uh, some in a pet store or just out in nature. But being outside can be very, very helpful. Shifting your thinking and self-talk. Um, your thinking is sometimes that um, things are always gonna go the way they did, nothing I can do can make a difference, that kind of stuff. Um, break out of a routine, try to do something new. Also, just doing that little thing can actually be very energizing in a way that might not seem possible from such a small uh, change. Sleep and relaxation is just as important as getting moving and, and watching what you eat and watching what you drink. We're talking about the amount of sleep that you get, which varies, but um, you can you know use some apps to determine what might be appropriate for you. Um, but also the quality. Um, again, research is showing that you wanna set the stage for a good night's sleep. And the recommendations include a cold or cool, dark, quiet room and eliminating electronics and that blue light that accompanies most of them as much as possible. And also before you go to bed to wind down intentionally and wake up mindfully. So those are some good things to think about, and they really can also help with stress. The last part is uh, that we're going to touch on is maximize success. Maximize success uh, is slightly different than the stress busters. 
Um, it's some ways that you can manage tasks and you can manage um, situations that are stressful, okay? It's not just managing the stress, but the situations themselves. So if you look at that little post-it note, of course, you're familiar with this. It says, don't sweat the small stuff. And the second rule is that it's all small stuff. To some extent, that is true. And that has to do a lot with shifting your perspectives and expectations. So the first thing about managing tasks is to set a goal. And you actually want to think about what you want to accomplish and what your priority is. There are ways that you can do that, but goal setting can be very, very helpful in helping you figure out um, what you want to do and what your priority is. So the first step is to evaluate what is the current situation and to be really honest about it. So if, for example, you want your child to start brushing their teeth by themselves and they're not doing it at all, that's a very different situation than if you want them to brush their teeth and they pretty much have the routine down, but they forget and they need a prompt or a reminder. So you have to think about what the current situation, before you set that goal, you want to take into consideration what your priority is. So let's look at toothbrushing again. Your goal is that you want your child to be able to do it by themselves. It's good for self-help skills. It frees up some time for yourself. And so your priority might be to get that toothbrushing routine uh, accomplished as quickly as possible for those reasons. But you have to look at the current situation and see if your expectations are realistic. Once you do that, then you'll make a plan. When you make the plan, you want to anticipate challenges. Okay, so what happens if they, um, you know, squeeze the toothpaste too hard and it goes all over the place? Maybe that means um, using um, the little individual packets of toothpaste or using a different kind of a container so that that can't happen. Maybe it means that you still have to be present in the room. Um, maybe you have to practice. Maybe you have to put up a chart with pictures. But whatever it is, you want to anticipate the challenges. And these same, same steps are actually with any kind of a task or goal setting that you want to do. You're going to focus on the choices and communication. And what that means really is, okay, I can do this or I can do that. And then you have to communicate it to other people. So you're always going to try to make a plan B. We're going for plan A, but plan B is we'll do this. Sometimes this comes up in terms of planning for a vacation um, or going out into the community. You want to be flexible. You'll be much more likely to set your goal if you're flexible and realize that we may not be able to stay someplace for an hour. We may uh, only stay for 15 minutes, but we can still participate to that extent. Um, you can also be adaptive. So part A is to be flexible and part B uh, is to be adaptive. And what this is, for example, is starting your own traditions. So maybe um, Thanksgiving is with the family is just too much. Uh, right now for your family. Maybe you do it with other families who have children with disabilities with whom there's a lot more um, ease and comfort to spend time together. Maybe you do something where you serve other people. Maybe for you and your children, all of your children, you set up a, a me day or um, a, a, a time in which um, everybody gets a chance to be the star for the day. So that maybe again, your goal and priority was to spend time with the siblings, but it's not realistic to be able to spend long periods of time, but you can start your own traditions as long as you keep in mind that there may be challenges, that your expectations are realistic, that you stay flexible and adapt to what's happening. Um, the other part of managing expectations is shifting your perspective. So I like this little sign, you know, goodbye, perfect, hello, life. <laughs> um, and realizing that you are doing a fabulous job. You're doing the best possible job that you can with the information and the resources and the situation as it exists. And um, one of the key things that keeps us sometimes from doing a better job of managing expectations is just thinking, are our expectations realistic? And if they're not, let go of it. That's something to let go of. Um, so it might mean that you 
do what's sort of an emotional spring cleaning? Am I holding on to past disappointments? Um, do I have some negative thoughts and fears because one time this happened, I'm never going to try that again because I don't want that to happen again? Or fears, maybe fears for safety or um, fears about acceptance. Um, do change whatever beliefs you have about asking for help. It's really, really important if you're going to have a more harmonious home and be um, not stress-free, but um, reduce stress is to be able to know when you need it and ask for help. Um, review your own priorities and see if they're realistic. Let's say we want to all eat dinner together. Can it be that dinner is sandwiches one night? Can it be leftovers from the night before, as long as we're all together and enjoying ourselves? Maybe the expectation, the priority is on being together and having communication versus, you know, a three course meal with China and, um, you know, a lot of fanfare and a lot of time, frankly. Um, especially if all the kids want to do is, you know, pick at the food and um, and hurry up and eat. Hit the pause button again. I think that's really important to to talk about again. Sometimes you just have to know when to um, insert some boundaries and just say, I, I can't do this right now. Um, or um, if I'm going to, then this has to happen you know, sort of an if-then scenario, and then reframe. So what I mean by reframe is um, sometimes something can go really wrong, and yet to remember that every day may not be good, but there is or can be, if we look for it, um, if we're open to receiving it, something good in every day. And I think that that's important to remember. Um, you know, maybe your child had an accident or maybe um, um, you got news that was a disappointment, but maybe there's already a resource available or, um, you know, your child who had an accident then came and snuggled in your arms and said, thank you for taking care of me, whether it's verbally or uh, using signs or just a hug and a big wet kiss, um, that there's something good in every day and, and to remember that and use that for the times that's not. Um, these are also some resources. Uh, you may be familiar with them already, but the Georgia, they're in alphabetical order, not in priority order, but Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities is really good for advocacy, um, especially when you have older family members in terms of community living, um, job coaching, independent living, self-advocacy, things like that. Um, they also have some good resources uh, for getting guardianship and SSI and things like that. The Georgia Department of Education, the um, DES, the Special Education Services and Supports, um, lists information for families, including um, uh, SB10, special needs funding, um, other resources and programs, and eligibility for um, services through special education. Um, National Dissemination Center for Children with Disabilities, which is usually referred to as NICHI, um, has a lot of really good resources and connection to state programs. This is a national dissemination center. Parent to Parent of Georgia um, also has wonderful resources for support, training. Um, they do presentations and then sometimes just like this one, they're recorded and those workshops and webinars are on their website. They also have parent counselors who you can talk with. Um, and they also are the home of something that's called F2F, Family to Family, which is a slightly different um, federally funded program for families who have children with um, chronic healthcare conditions and certain resources for that population. And of course, special needs, Cobb is a wonderful resources. So just some really quick takeaway thoughts. I just like this. Um, think about this in terms of managing your stress and strengthening your family. Life is like a camera. Focus what's on what's important. Capture the good times. Develop from the negatives. And if things don't work out, just take another shot. Be kind to yourself and your family. And uh, thank you for 
your uh, focus today. I'm going to end for sharing with me. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everybody. And uh, I'll let uh, Alexa open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Cheryl. That was a uh, really fantastic and very informational. I myself am over here. I'm not even a parent. I'm just a cat parent and I'm over here taking notes. So I appreciate it. <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and open up for questions. Uh, Denisha asked a quick question about a uh, special needs cob. Um, so just for everybody's benefit, um, we have 22 group homes in Cobb County and one in uh, Cartersville. They are um, the homes of special needs adults, um, adults with developmental disabilities. It's uh, four per home. It's fully staffed by our partner providers, which are in community, uh, Jewish Family and Career Services, United Cerebral Palsy, and RHA. Um, you have to be at least 18 years old to live in one of our group homes, and you have to have the now comp waiver. That's not the case for every organization. Um, some places um, take different waivers or do self-pay for it to be, but to be a resident in a special needs cob home, you have to have an outcome waiver. <clears throat> um, Teresa asked, uh, where are some great sources to find a counselor specializing in family therapy and special needs families? Um, I can answer that one. So it it is hard uh, sometimes to find those, but I will say that if you're connected with um, a um, a school, you can check at your child's school, especially if they're you know if they have an IEP and they're getting supports and resources. The school counselors that work with the children who are in special education may be able to work with you. That's one source. Hospitals, again, particularly if they're like children's hospitals, um, you know, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, where I was before going back to private practice, um, had a whole social work department and they did have social workers um, who were trained to work um, with disabilities specifically for things like chronic health conditions. Many of those programs had their own social worker in that department. Marcus Autism Center has a team of social workers, um, things like that. So hospitals, educational settings, um, some therapy practices are set up to do that as well. Um, and some of the um, parent to parent is a really good resource. Um, if you're looking for autism specific, which is what I'm really familiar with um, now a lot is um, AANE, which is another organization that does a lot of support groups for families. Um, and again, organizations like um, uh, the, um, the Governor's Council or the Georgia Council, it's its old name, the Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities, Parent to Parent, disability specific organizations, whether it's local, regional, or national. Um, Psychology Today will list psychologists um, by their specialty and um, as well as um, if you're looking specifically for family therapy, um, through the Georgia Psychological Association, they have a search feature where you can um, look for something particular like uh, disabilities. Um, and then I get a lot of referrals actually from physicians. So you might even wanna ask your um, pediatrician or childcare provider if they know of anybody as well, because sometimes um, folks who do work similar to what I do um, are known to those professionals and you know we share referrals back and forth. Okay, um, Linda asked if Cheryl would be willing um, to share your PowerPoint. Um, she would like to look at some of the pages like the Stress Busters and some of the other um, tips that you have listed. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and Cheryl, I think maybe if you send it to me and then I can send it out to everybody, that would probably be the easiest. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Be, it's too much text to, to have to remember yeah. or <laughs> try to copy it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So Linda, I'll make sure, um, when I send out the video link to everyone, I'll also send out, um, Cheryl's slide deck so that everybody can refer back to it. At their leisure. Um, uh, 
Carrie asked if you could also provide some information about resources and books for siblings. Um, also, if you can think of any uh, specific activities that you can suggest for helping a sibling not becoming overwhelmed with concern for their brother or sister with autism. Excellent question. So um, um, about 10 years ago, I co-authored a book. It's called Brothers and Sisters of Exceptional Families. Um, and we had a whole resource section. Now the book, um, it can be found still on Amazon. It's um, no longer in print. Well, it's no longer through the publisher, but you can get used copies of it for a very reasonable cost. And um, a, some of the resources, to be quite honest, are probably out of date, but it really had excellent resources for a lot of those kinds of things. For um, autism and specific, specifically, I can tell you that Spectrum Autism Support Group, um, I think it's their website is actually atlspectrum.org. Um, does run sibling support groups. I did it years ago uh, for them, but they do have sibling support groups. There are some online resources and there are some very, very good books out there that both explain autism um, in a way that a child can understand and also um, help to uh, talk about it from the sibling perspective. Uh, Probably also, if again, if you uh, are looking for resources for autism here, I would start first with Spectrum. Uh, I might even try the Autism Speaks website. And if you're um, looking for um, books and resources, again, um, if your child is receiving services someplace, I would check with those providers, whether or not it's an ABA provider or um, a pediatrician, because they may have access to some of those as well. Um, you can also just Google on Amazon. There are actually are some books that are in Spanish as well as in English. Um, I, uh, when I was at Marcus Autism Center, I directed the case management program and we did a lot of, um, the family support activities there. And I always looked for books to have in our resource center that were appropriate for children to explain autism. I think you had one more part of the question about, so the kids don't become overwhelmed. Was that it? Um, yes, it was. Okay. So some of those things that I talked about when I talked about siblings are, are some of the advice that I usually do give to families. Uh, oftentimes siblings can be really great uh, modelers and playmates for their siblings, but sometimes too often they can also be the one that says, uh, you go do that or go grab that for me or watch him for this period of time. And that can become overwhelming if they're being given too many caregiving roles or there are expectations um, beyond um, what uh, a sibling would do for, you know, as any older brother or sister in terms of how much. Um, I usually suggest to families in that case um, to talk, sit down and talk with the child and, and listen. Don't get defensive. It's really hard, especially if that child says, I don't like it. It's not fair. You are this, et cetera. Um, just listen to understand. Don't listen to try to have to explain it. But be realistic. Again, it's those realistic expectations. I may not be able to... Um, you know, do exactly what I do for your brother or your sister, but I can do this or this. Some of the things that have been wonderful suggestions from kids um, have been things like um, letting their room, if they have their own room, be quote unquote, an autism free zone. And um, that that's considered a safe space where children can um, leave papers out or, you know, have privacy and quiet time to do homework, have time if friends come over where they can do things and not worry about their sibling um, interrupting or destroying a project or something that it is okay for them to have some time without their brother or sister who's on the spectrum. Uh, particularly if challenging behaviors are an issue, that you do periodically have some me alone time. Um, and um, one parent I remember talking with who said that um, 
her child understood everything that we were talking about, but would periodically say to her mother, mom, I need a me day. Um, and a me day might be going to get a manicure, going uh, to the park, going for an ice cream, but just, you know, mom and uh, that child, um, giving them permission to ask for what they need. Um, recognizing their accomplishments, but not necessarily putting too much pressure on them. Sometimes parents maybe want to overcompensate, um, and that's not fair either, because again, most children do understand at some point they may have to be involved in the care of their sibling, um, and they're prepared for it, but not necessarily um, all the time right now. So they can be the best advocates, um, having a sibling with a disability can be a real eye opener. Um, studies have shown that children who grow up in homes where there's a representation across the spectrum of ability um, have a real emphasis and understanding about fairness and justice and many choose professions that are more considered in the helping professions because they've learned the importance of this at home. So don't worry either that um, just because it's stressful at home that you're not providing a loving home in which all family members can thrive. That's a wonderful. Yeah. Um, when I send you guys out the survey later um, in just a bit, if you have interest in um, any, any of the topics that Cheryl has, has discussed with us today, if you want to go more in depth, please put that in the survey so that I know I always love to hear feedback and it helps me plan for um, future workshops that are that are directly beneficial to you all. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Okay, I answered Denise's question. Does anybody else have any questions for Cheryl? Um, can I answer Denise's question about the comp mm -hmm. waiver? Sure. Uh, this is um, not in this conversation, but it's, again, something that I'm very familiar with and, and I know is a concern for parents. So um, what Denisha wrote is that her son's on the comp waiting list. It's actually probably the now comp waiting. It, it's both now and comp. Um, and that he's been on there for over 10 years since he was six years old, was told that it'll be a 10 year wait list at the time when I signed him up, was told he has to age out of school before getting the waiver. Did anyone, um, Denisha, are you comfortable going off mute or putting it in the chat? Has anyone explained to you why that's the case? Well, I'll take that as a no. So let me explain this to people because it's really important. The, um, the services that the state provides to individuals with um, developmental disabilities um, after, as, as they enter adulthood, um, are called the NOW and COMP waiver. The NOW waiver, which stands for new, um, new options waiver, and the COMP, which is short for comprehensive, have to do with the types of services that each provides. The NOW part of the waiver um, covers day supports and the COMP is for like residential, as Alexa was saying, to live in one of their group homes, you have to have the COMP waiver because that's additional funding that can be used to pay for residential care. Um, because the state only has so many allocations, and once they give someone a waiver, the likelihood is that that individual may stay on the waiver for the rest of their lives. Um, the state only gets approval through the state assembly every year, and there, there's a whole um, group of people working on that, and it's called Unlock the Waiting List. So if you ever want to go to the Unlock website, you can read a lot about why this is the way it is. Um, but that the feeling is, is that for the day parts of the supports, for most individuals while they're in school, which again can be till age 18 or up until age 22, the 22nd birthday through special education, that the um, individuals wouldn't need those day supports, that they can get therapies and um, programs and all of that um, through school. 
the thought also is that it's only once that child reaches adulthood that they would be um, considering moving out of the family home into a group setting. And so again, because of the limited resources, they uh, recommend that you go on the waiting list as soon as possible so that the state's aware of um, uh, what the needs are and that um, uh, they can plan accordingly. Um, and there is something called a planning list. So, Denisha, to answer your question, though, that's why they're telling you that. But every year you have an ISP coordinator, um, a support coordinator, and they should be contacting you to ask you um, if um, there's any changes. If, there, if you have significant changes where perhaps it's really, really necessary for your child to receive services outside of school or maybe you know, residential care now, you need to let them know because there's no hard and fast rule about when your child will get the waiver. It's need-based as well as time-based. So you should keep on top of it. Somebody should be contacting you at least once a year. You want to let them know if things have um, uh, changed in any way that would change uh, the need. So I hope that information is helpful because um, this comes up um, a lot and it's um, it's very confusing. I, I truly understand that. Um, so for the mom here, Lucy, your son is 21. Um, uh, yes, 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 yes. You have to get on this now. It's a very easy application. Um, the first part of it, Alexa, um, provided it. Um, as long as he's in school, I would really encourage you if you're going to be applying for this waiver um, and your psychological evaluation is more than three years old from school to get it redone while your child is still in school, because that is one of the things that they're going to want to see is a, an, a, a, a psychological evalu developmental evaluation so that they can document the, the disability. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so you may not need it yet, but if you think you're going to, um, just do that. Uh, Carrie Jones, yes, it is Unlock Georgia with Rita Young, who is a wonderful, wonderful advocate. So if you if you need more information about that, she's a fabulous resource. Yeah, we actually did. I think towards the end of last year, we did a session with Rita about Unlock. So Carrie, if you go. If you haven't watched that, if you go on our website, um, specialneedscom.org forward slash workshops, you can find that recording. Yeah. Um, and if that's for anybody else who might be interested in it. Um, also, while we're on the subject of NowCom, if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, please email me. <laughs> like anybody. <laughs> it doesn't here, make sense. <laughs> if you don't know what we're talking about, please email me because you need to know what we're talking about. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Send me an email. I'll get back with you as soon as <clears throat> as soon as you email me because it's super important to get on it earlier, to get on it now. Yes. Yes, Carrie. Yes. Rita is amazing. She is wonderful. She's yes. done a lot of hard work for all of us. Yes. What else? Um, I think I missed, somebody asked about guardianship. Um, I'm not sure where that went. Oh, Chisa. Um, if you, um, I can send you some resources about guardianship. I'm going to write, I'm going to write, write it down, Chisa. <clears throat> I don't know it off the top of my head, but I can send those to you in an email. Um, Governor's Council on Development of Disabilities has resource on it. Parent to Parent um, also has, and that may be part of your resources, um, um, uh, a webinar. Um, there's someone in the community named Debbie Dobbs um, mm -hmm. who helps with deeming waiver, but the guardianship, there's some attorneys um, who also um, have some information on their website. So I'm sure, um, Alexa, you have those resources. Yeah, Lucy, you want the information for guardianship. Can you put your um, email um, in the chat for me, please?
Maria said that focus has a good recording for guardianship. I believe it for mm -hmm. sure. I think we we may have one too. Yes. Gotcha. <clears throat> Okay, does anybody else have any more questions for Cheryl about this or about anything else? I, I have one last question. Mm -hmm. I put it on my raise button for some reason. Um, one of the things that Ms. Rhodes had mentioned was how important respite is. And um, as all parents, you know, I'm sure we're very protective of our children and one thing that I'm coming to is that some of my supports are um, not here anymore in Georgia. How do you go about finding respite? You know, I'm familiar with how to do it for foster care because I used to work in the foster care system. But when it comes with special needs, how do you even begin that process? These are strangers that you really don't know or camps that can provide these services. but could you give any feedback on how do you even start considering outside resources other than family and friends? Um, I'll be on part of that, but I'll let Cheryl start with that. Do you want to? Do you want to start, or do you want me to? Yeah. So, so Teresa, we we offer respite at Special Needs Cobb, um, and a big part of the process of applying is going on a tour, uh, meeting with at least, you know, one of us staff people. And during the tour, um, you, you would get to see the home and you would also get to answer any questions. It's, you know, an hour dedicated to you, your questions and your concerns. Um, and of course we have certain qualifications. You may not qualify for ours, but we can always refer you out to someone else. Um, I don't know if that is helpful or not, but please feel free to reach out to me and we can talk more about respite. We have a really great respite program. Um, let me give you just a little more information. So um, there's two sides to it. It's one side obviously is finding the provider and the other is paying for it. Um, if you have, even if you haven't, but if you have applied for the now and comp waiver that um, unicorn that we're all talking about, um, you should qualify for something that's called family support. And within the state, there are different agencies that are designated as the agencies that help families in certain counties um, find fam find, uh, get family support dollars. It's not a very large budget, but you can get some help. If those agencies will be able to give you the names of some programs and sometimes individuals who provide respite. Um, uh, in the Metro Atlanta area, one of those groups is the um, Bobby Dodd. Uh, it's the Bobby Dodd Foundation, Bobby Dodd Institute, Alexa. I don't know what they're calling it these days, but if you just look up Bobby Dodd and Family Support. Bobby Dodd Institute, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and family support is what we're talking about. Now, when you're looking for someone with for respite, it's also a good idea to try to go through an organization that you're familiar with, whether it's um, Special Needs Cobb or Spectrum that I mentioned before does respite. They do um, camp programs also. Um, they do these family weekend camps, which really is respite for the whole family. Um, and they do Saturday respite programs. Focus used to. I think they've really cut back on their um, respite programs. But there are some other um, well-respected um, nonprofit organizations that provide respite or at least can give you some leads. If you've never used respite, um, it it can be such a help to the family. One way that respite is helpful is in creating those opportunities for other family members to, to get a rest. So your loved one gets to go and you know have a really great fun day or maybe even a weekend. Um, but again, siblings and parents get just a, a little bit of a break. Also. Um, and one of the things that I always did when I was going to interview respite providers 
especially if I was going to bring my child to their home or to a facility for any period of time, is I would bring my child with me and see how she responded. Um, you know, you you might want to look at safety, um, staffing, um, the location, how far are you going to have to drive? Um, if your child has any medical needs, mine had seizures, for example. So um, I needed to make sure that there was somebody there who could give her medication and also implement um, emergency procedures if necessary. Um, you also want to know if they're qualified in terms of the kinds of behaviors your child has, or if your child is nonverbal and can't really communicate, how good are they at reporting uh, to you and letting you know um, what the weekend really was like? You know, so what kind of questions do they ask? How do they interact with your child? Um, and then in those situations where your child may not be the best reporter, you know, uh, sometimes they won't let you do it, but you might just ask to see if. Um, you know, who is going to be the person who will be interacting with my child and just observe for a few minutes if you can, you know, or ask questions when you pick up. Um, I think in most cases, it's such a wonderful um, time and everybody feels good about respite. It, the biggest problem is mostly how do you pay for it and how do you find it? <laughs> Once people use it, they understand why it's worth the effort um, because just for that chance to renew and refresh, um, as well as for your family member with special needs to have some time where they're the one who's the focus of attention and they're the one that people are planning fun activities for. Um, I just wanted to add something. Uh, thank you for that advice. It's so good. Uh, <clears throat> I use an in community. They will help you with the funding and also send you a list of, um, providers once you're approved for the funding. So they will send your agencies and individuals that actually um, are approved through them to provide uh, the rest of the service and they will pay them directly. Again, the funds is not as much, but it's still something. So um, I think when you Google in community, you should find them. So they said the middle Atlanta area as well. So call Gune, Odika, Putin and all of that. So just look for it. You can look for that as well. They, it's a very easy application, very easy, and that's what I've been using. Good. And have you found providers to um, give you the respite you need? Yes, we don't need it as much because I do have a lot of family support, but for the few times that we have needed, yes, it was very helpful, and we were satisfied with the provider. Oh, good. And may I ask you, just for everybody else's knowledge, um, did you have the respite provider come to your home or did you have your um, child family member go someplace else to receive the it respite? Was in -home. We've done in-home about three times, maybe. Okay. And then I know uh, my friend that also did the, she had to drop the child off. Yeah, because it works both ways, and sometimes that's family choice, which way you're going to be more comfortable. Right. Great. Yeah, and um, in community is the provider that we work for, uh, work with for our respite. So when we submit vouchers um, for our guests, it goes to in community. Um, just reading the chat, I see Alexa thanked um, Carrie for her kind words, but I'd also like to just highlight what um, the end of what Carrie said, which is, um, she said that this was really helpful, but she said that it was um, uh, the tips for um, caregivers so that we can be the best version of ourselves for mm -hmm. those who need us most. And I, I couldn't say that better. I think that if, if as we're going to be ending soon, I think that's the a wonderful way for us to end thinking that when we talk about um, these topics and uh, stress and um, family harmony, what we're really talking about is creating a condition um, in which you can be the best version of yourselves for those who need you most. Mm -hmm.